Welcome back, everybody, to the Places You'll Go show, sponsored by the Marketing Skills Trust. Happy to have a, another fabulous guest on the show today in John Seals. Welcome, John. Thanks, both. Thanks for having me. Well, it is a real treasure to have you on. Uh, John, obviously, we've both known you for quite some while. We worked together at HSBC a few moons ago, yeah. and you're actively involved with the, with the School of Marketing in terms of being one of our fabulous mentors for the Mentoring Gen Z scheme. Uh, and so I'm just going to do a bit of a summary of who John Sills is. Actually, John and I, we just live a few miles apart and have actually shared the odd curry at the last Viceroy in Bourne End, which I can thoroughly recommend. I think you would too as well, John. Um, John is an intelligent, curious, funny, and 100% customer guy. This shines through in his blogs. I just actually read you one this week about the ghosts in our houses from homeworking. We might come on to that. But he shares his customer experience screw-ups on his travels. He recently actually helped me to claim a refund for a very heavily delayed train journey that we shared home from London. There we go. But if I talk about John's trajectory, so he worked at HSBC for over 11 years and subsequently has worked at the foundation where he's managing partner for the last eight. Uh, just to know the foundation helps organize organizations achieve customer-led success by really focusing on what matters to customers, undercovering, under, uncovering the annoyingly inconvenient truths and unlocking creative and practical new ideas. Also, a published author, The Human Experience, where John argues that organizations have focused so much on perfecting functional experience, they've lost sight of the emotional side. Now, I'll be really honest, I haven't had time to read it yet. So I asked ChatGPT, what did it think? And it said this, the book has received positive reviews on online platforms such as Amazon and Goodreads, where readers have praised its focus on the importance of empathy, collaboration, and emotional intelligence in effective leadership. It offers practical tips and advice for leaders who want leaders who want to create a positive and productive work environment that prioritizes the well-being and growth of their team members. I think that was quite good, actually. Yeah. But if we go back in time, John actually started his career 25 years ago on a market stall in Essex. He's been a bank manager during the financial crisis. He's been in frontline teams delivering the experience and innovation and propositions that customers deserve and want. And he is passionate about fostering creativity and also enterprising mindsets in children. Again, had interaction with you, John, on this. My daughter did Young Enterprise, and you're a, I think you're a local or regional, maybe even national representative of Young Enterprise, and also work with Adoption UK. You're a bit of a star, John. Fabulous to have you on, and I couldn't be more pleased that you've finally, we finally got around to having you on after all this time. We've been talking about it, but here we are now, so fabulous to have you. Thanks, but as you say, that was that was highly embarrassing to listen to. Thank you, and I am I am blushing slightly. But yeah, it's been great. It's been great to kind of have both of you as part of my career in kind of interlooping ways and working around in those circles. But it does make me sound that twenty five years does make me sound very old, particularly because I think I might have written that line a couple of years ago. So I think it might even be nearer thirty now, which is even more scary. But let's not dwell on that. Oh well, there we are. But don't worry, man. You look you're looking good. Gotta say, looking good. Am I? <laughs> Am I? Absolutely. <laughs> And for all those who are just on audio, um, John behind him has got some some wonderful memorabilia, um, particularly a big, massive poster of his book that's just come out. So I have to start there. So, John, tell us about it. I mean, what's going on? I mean, how, how's it all panning out for you? Literally released a couple of weeks ago, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, first first of uh, February came out. It's, it's just a great experience. Um, you know, I, I, I really love writing and I really loved writing the book. And I remember, you know, when I got to the end of the book about a year or so ago, I had this kind of slightly bereft feeling because I had become such a habitual part of my day doing the writing. I kind of just felt a bit sad I wasn't doing it anymore, that kind of principle of flow and doing something that you love. And then there's kind of a second stage of it, which is you see the book actually in real life. And there's a slightly out of body experience to see your name on something. And you go, oh, that feels quite cool, but, you know, feels a bit detached. And now I'm in this third stage that I absolutely hadn't anticipated because I'm completely naive about all this, which is just really lovely, which is, you know, just feeling lots of positivity and uh, not necessarily about the book, although people have been positive about that. But just this feeling that people are very supportive and you two are absolutely two of those people being very supportive, kind of in your corner. And yeah, I think everyone should get to have this phase where there's just a few weeks of people just kind of saying nice stuff, really. So it's just been a really, really uh lovely experience writing it and um yeah it definitely makes me want to do makes me want to do more well it's it, i mean i know you like writing i think many people have the aspiration i'm putting myself in this bracket the aspiration of having a book but they don't actually particularly like writing or find it hard whereas of course you know your your blogs are frequent and very well thought through um 
I, I wonder that all these situations they put yourself in to have all these customer experiences to to write about. But it seems like writing is a natural process. So where, where does that come from? Well, it's really quite lucky in a way. I mean, I certainly wasn't someone who did a lot of writing when I was younger. You know, I wasn't particularly brilliant at school um, and didn't really do much in my 20s. It was actually when I was thinking about leaving HSBC, I, I kind of started to have, I was having all these thoughts and I thought, well, I need to try and get them down somewhere. And I thought, well, actually, if I'm going to go out into the big wide world, I should probably have something that people are going to Google about me. So I thought, well, I'll start a blog and start to put some of those thoughts down. And immediately I saw the benefit of it, of just organizing your thoughts, you know, of the wrestling, you know, these kind of half thoughts you've got in your head or things you've observed and starting to get them down on paper to make sense of them, because what you end up with is very different to what you think you're going to be writing. Um, and, and that's the process of it allows you to think through it. And then, of course, it means that you, when you're going to have conversations and now I'm a consultant, you know, you've got points of view that you can you can share and use as well. So so I think it was I think it was that I think it was starting to just really enjoy the process of it and also then having this need. Um, and I'm certainly not putting myself in this bracket, but Jerry Seinfeld talks about his writing and he talks about observation. Like there, there are different types of people and some people are a bit more observant about what's going on in the world. And you just see stuff. And I see a lot of stuff that I just find is quite funny, really. Just silly things you see in customer experience, but just generally. And there's just this feeling of this need to, well, I kind of want to record that and put that down somewhere, even if no one else reads it. So that's why I started kind of just writing all these blogs, really, those two reasons. And then I've just found it a really crucial part to how I work and how I think. And then people start to kind of get to know you a little bit about it. And you get lovely responses, like when people like yourselves just send a quick email and say, oh, I really enjoyed that. And that's, I suppose, a little um, boost of dopamine or adrenaline as well. Um, so, yeah, that's how I've kind of ended up. and then got to the point where I thought actually there's a guy called Patrick Harris who will come onto this later but who's a mentor of mine and he came into the office uh, one day when I wasn't in and he left a post-it on my desk and it said you are ready to write a book and just underlined it and so I promised him I would leave that post-it on my desk until I'd written a book and uh, that was that was three years between those two things so I eventually got to tidy my desk a couple of a couple of weeks ago but yeah it's a really crucial part of my career I think of how I think and how I work now. Yeah, how wonderful uh, Patrick gets to fulfill um, his, his little piece of nugget of advice there, right? You find, you finally did it. Yeah, I find it interesting. I, I too like to, to put pen to paper a lot. And actually what I, what I tend to do is to um, sort of listen to a piece of stimuli or try and find something in the external world. And as, as immediately as I can, literally try and take some notes around it. And then all of a sudden, you, like you say, right, from a, from a passive piece of information, it becomes an active thought memory where you reflect and join dots along the way. Yeah. Um, and I think that's really where a lot of magic happens, where creativity can really happen. Um, so it's, it's wonderful. It's a wonderful thing to do and to share. Um, I actually wonder if, if to what extent, and I, I suspect a lot of people have this ambition, maybe Mark, you, you alluded to it. Um, but is it some, and you talked about the principle of flow. So joining those two things together, do you think that you need to kind of actively, constantly be thinking about what you may be writing next? Or is it just sort of a very kind of um, organic thing that, that comes to you? Yeah, no, I think I think there's a couple of things there. Just going back on your on your first point, Richie, I think one of the best bits of advice I was ever given was just carry a notebook with you everywhere, because and now we can all do that because we've got our phones with us, which you know kind of negates the the need to carry our physical notebook. Although I still I still do, just because you're right, you just see stuff, and that's how serendipity occurs by like having your head up and looking around and seeing things around the world. And I think we lose a lot of that by looking at our phones all the time. You know, you just kind of heads up, you see things, you drop stuff down. And then those things, Stephen Johnson calls it the slow hunch, start to connect together in your brain over time. And that's where these ideas come from. So I think that's that's really crucial, that kind of serendipitous, but making the conditions for serendipity to to occur, I, I suppose. Um and then and then on your on your second question, yeah, I think it's I think it's quite interesting. I think you uh I, I agree that you need to kind of write things down as soon as possible. I think for me, it depends on everybody. You know, Ellen Lewis gave me, she's a brilliant writer. She gave me a great bit of advice as well once, which was just write. She said the difference between people that want to write books and the people that write books are the people that write books write, which sounds so simple, but it's true. <laughs> you know, you just need to, you just need to write and just see what comes out. And then, then you start to see whether you've got something or not. I do think though, there is something about, um, habit and there's something about having a commitment device 
So for me, the blog is really useful because it gives me something to put my writing on. And the fact that I've got a few people, you know, not loads, but I've got enough people probably that follow that blog now or follow on LinkedIn that I kind of feel like, well, when I put it out, it's almost a bit of a commitment to some of those people. Not that I'm under any impression they're sat there waiting for my writing, by the way. But there's an element of, okay, well, I'm writing it for someone and I'm going to put it out and someone's going to see it. Now, if if I didn't have that blog and it was just writing for my own sake and I can, I've got a diary right next to me here which uh, I write in. And this is a great example because no one else reads this and I'm probably writing it about once every six months. So it's right there. The intention is, oh, I should really keep writing stuff and noting it down, but I don't do it. So I think having that commitment device is, is really important. And then the habit as well. Um, so Stephen King talks about, you know, he writes a thousand words every day. And that's Stephen King. He gets up, has breakfast, writes a thousand words, whether it takes him an hour or five hours, and then he stops. And Jerry Seinfeld, who I mentioned, write for three hours every day. And all of these writers, and you'll get a sense as I'm talking, but a lot of my folks are modeling, you know, great behavior and seeing what you can do with that. They have these kind of just set habits you put in. And I think if you do want to get into writing, you do need to give yourself that, okay, I'm going to do one a week. I'm going to do it on a Monday morning. And you've got to make sure it's at the top of your to-do list and you do it first, because it will always be the thing that drops down behind the more important email. So yeah, mm. you do need to, you do need to have that focus around it, I think. Well, well John, I think it's going to be a bestseller. Um, and I'm just, I'm, the metaphor that's coming to mind for, for you is, you know, that photo that circulated where everyone's on a platform, a train platform, staring at their phones. And then there's the one guy who's not staring at his phone. And the, the caption underneath is, what is this dude looking at? The <laughs> yeah. world? What's his and, problem? <laughs> yeah. And, and uh, so you're a heads up guy. Um, but I, what I want to do is I just want to join the dots between market trader to managing partner. In a in a sort of a relatively whistle stop, I suppose. How do you join those dots? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you get a, a lot of luck, actually. So um, so I started, yeah, when I was 14, I was working on a market store in Clapton Market, Clapton on C in Essex, which used to be famous for having a great peer and now is famous for the UK's first UKIP MP. So that's nice. Um, but yeah, just like a pound an hour working on a haberdashery stall, you know, not, not a big job, but you know, you just, you just start to understand people a little bit. Um, and then I uh, had several jobs that I worked at weekends in the summer. I worked at WH Smith's and Burton's menswear at the same time. I worked at Safeway. I was, uh, you know, always trying to be the fastest checkout boy. And then when I went to uni, I stayed working full time at Burton's menswear as well because I did a history degree and actually you don't have many, many hours. And and all of that is early in my career, but really relevant because I think it became clear to me quite early on. I, I was like a people person, if you want to call it that. I just I really loved that environment. I love being about around customers, understanding people, kind of helping people, observing people. And actually, I felt like I'm good at this. I'm quite good at this. So when I applied for the graduate scheme at HSBC, I went into the graduate scheme and actually I think they probably recruited me as much for my retail experience as they did for the fact I'd had the degree. I think it was that combination of the academic, but actually probably the, vo the vocational that probably helped me help me get through to that. And then as you, as you said earlier, so then I did a kind of series of roles, but I think, you know, I'll, I'll, as I talk you through this, what stands out is I had no idea what I wanted to do and I was constantly wrong. Um, so, you know, when I went into the branches, so I, I, I was a, I started out on the till stamping checks. I uh, ran branches. I was a coach. I became an area manager. I was convinced I never wanted to work in head office because head office looked gray and boring. And I thought all the action is here. And everyone around me was telling me, you're a retail guy. You should definitely be staying in the branches. Your career is here. Then I went to visit head office and I thought, oh, this is really cool. Like it's really vibrant. They're making big decisions that affect millions of people and you could really make a difference here. So I got lucky. Someone took a punt on me and gave me a job at, uh, at head office for HBC, looking after uh, working in the premier proposition in the segments team. And then, and that's where obviously I met, I met the two of you and we had a great time. We had a great time there. And then when I was in head office in the UK, I remember thinking, I never want to work in group. I don't want to work globally. Those guys, I don't know what they're doing. They just sit up there you know, in some mythical, even bigger ivory tower. And we're the ones that are really making the difference in the market. And then I met someone from Group and they offered me a job in global customer experience. And I thought, oh, that could be quite cool, actually. And that turned out to be really interesting, working across 
20 different markets and seeing what the again it's all about people and observing people seeing the same indifference between between people around the world and and i remember very clearly thinking at that point i really hate consultants like they just come in with their backpacks they take up my desks they just give me slides with triangles on they tell me stuff i already know like i re- you know, really really kind of don't want to be a consultant and then and you'll get where the story is going now uh someone said well you should meet charlie from the foundation and I was like, oh, do I have to? Like another consultant. They were like, no, they're really good, really good. And I remember going into this meeting with Charlie and a guy called Greg, who was one of the other senior consultants. And he just came in with a blank piece of paper and it was a really nice conversation. They asked me some really smart questions that made me feel a little bit stupid in quite a good way. And the week later, I went to their office and it was full of post-its and interesting people that were interested in asking good questions. It had a real kind of nice feeling about the atmosphere, very kind of empowering. Everyone was free to throw in their opinion. And I thought, oh, yeah, this is this is the kind of consultancy I could do. Um, so then I you know, agreed to kind of go and work at the foundation and, and the rest is history. So the thread looking back has always been about people and understanding people and observing people, regardless of what I've done. But the, the plan was never any more than being interested, trying to find out about other particular roles that might be available and. I didn't, you know, I didn't know consultancy was even a thing until I was 30. Like it, it was never even before I moved to kind of properly the head office, it was never something I would have ever considered because I just didn't know it existed as a career where I was growing up. No one did that. No one did that. It was all builders and, and you know, everything else and other trades. So it just wasn't a thing. So it wasn't until I was 30 that I knew about that. So looking back, you can join the dots. But on the way, I was basically wrong many times. I tell you, it's 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 so um, it's so John Sills to be able to have articulated that career story in that way. It's just so lighthearted, humorous, and and you you really bring bring your whole self here. And you know what I took away from that was perhaps the difference between uh, perception and lived experience. And I think that's kind of an interesting thing, whether it's in the in the customer landscape or the way you've articulated how you've navigated or, or jumped from different things that you thought had a certain thing that you may not enjoy, but dived in with both feet and all of a sudden, you know, you landed in a place that you you really enjoy and you really, really like. I wonder if there's any any sort of takeaways from that um, or things that you've thought about in that way. Yeah, I think I think there's a huge amount of stuff. I mean, I definitely think that that phrase of less certainty, more inquiry. You know, when I was in my 20s, like, like a lot of people, I'm sure I was very certain. I probably flirted with the borderline of confidence and arrogance and you know, felt like I knew I knew what was what was best. I remember kind of hanging up the phone on my boss more than once when I was in the branches because I felt I knew what we what we should what we should be doing. And then, like so many people, as I've my career's developed, I've realised actually saying I don't know, let's go and find out, is probably the most important thing you can you can ever say uh, in any part of your life. Actually, so so I think that's been a, that's been a really huge a really huge part. I think there's something about again, I just I'm just quoting other people's quotes for that. Uh, to be interesting be interested uh, you know similar point but you, know, you really the, the most interesting people I know are the people that read widely and they want to just go and meet people without agenda just go and have interesting conversations with interesting people and just kind of see what comes out of that because again it's how you create that context for serendipity I mean my you know my career is like so many people is built on a lot of luck I mean you know I could very well have not have met Charlie that day you know, the person that gave me the, I could not have gone to the head office and the day I went to head office, it could have been a much worse experience. You know, there's, uh, even when I went to the HSBC uh, graduate assessment center, it was a two day thing. And, uh, you know, in the evening they said, well, you can go to the bar, but don't worry, you're not being assessed. And then of course, you know, you are, but one kid really didn't take that on board. Um, and so just ended up getting kind of completely drunk and throwing up in the corner and he didn't come back for day two. And you think, well, maybe I've got his spot. <laughs> you know, you don't know. So, uh, I don't know, but but yeah, I think that that focus on certain, you know, it's less certainty, more inquiry, kind of really being interested, trying to create those conditions for serendipity. I think the other thing, which actually I was talking about yesterday with the book, because I've written a book, you know, in case the social media onslaught hasn't made that. Have you written a book? Yeah, I've written a book apparently. Yeah, Chat GPT knows about it and everything. <laughs> um, it is about being bold. And just acting and trying stuff. I think acting and learning is a huge thing. I mean, this the reason we were talking about it yesterday is because with the book, I just decided to send it out to a few people that um, I really respect. People like Tim Harford, the writer, and the Do Lectures over in Cardigan. And these groups, I don't know. But I think, well, just try it, actually, and just see what happens. And, you know, luckily, not all of them have come back, but a couple of them have come back and said, 
yeah, like that's great or it looks great or sharing it on social media. And I think you just, you need to make stuff happen. You can't just wait around and wait for other people to tell you or other people to ask you. Like if you want to do something, do it, try it and just see what happens. And then, you know, you're replacing in your own mind that, you know, unknowing with the certainty that it either works or it doesn't work. And then you move on and try the next thing. So mm -hmm. that, that again, I think has been a really important part as I look back that I'm generally someone that just tries stuff. And if it works great, and if it doesn't, well, you learn something from that anyway, and, and on you go. Thank you, John. Uh, I'm just going to pull up on something you said, which didn't quite land with me. Huh. You said earlier in your career, you flirted with the balance between confidence and arrogance. Yeah. I, I don't see that. And so I'm going to ask you this question, which is, you know, when you get feedback, 50% of the feedback is the person is about the person who's giving the feedback. Yeah. And 50% is genuine or maybe true or congruent. But I mean, you're a very generous guy. We're going to come on to talk about your work with Young Enterprise and Adoption UK. You're a very generous soul. You're very humble. You've got lots of humility. Is that is that real that you were thought you were in an arrogant space? Uh, it's, it's, it's a very good question. I think I don't think I ever fully believed I was arrogant. I, I think I, I think inside I've always had kind of self-deprecation. And I think I've always just had an awareness of, you know, none of this matters <laughs> in a sense of like you know you can you know you, you, my, my nan who um I, I write about just a tiny bit in the book she lived till she was 101 and she had two bits of advice one was drink whiskey every day and the other one was laugh at the world and and I think that second bit of advice is so true because it when you think about it it is all a bit ridiculous like everything's a bit ridiculous really you know where we are and what we're doing and and so I do think you need to have that ability to to laugh and so I do I do think I have always been able to have that and have that perspective so yeah I probably don't think I ever was arrogant but I did think that I was very confident and that could be perceived by other people as being arrogant and I think that's where it is important to understand the context understand how other people might might react and might be thinking how your behavior even if it's not right and like I say there was a couple of times when I just kind of really disagreed with what my my manager was asking me to do it was about whether or not a, a member of the team was going to change their role or not we ended up getting quite heated on the phone and I kind of I remember it really distinctly probably because it's the only time I've done it, I ever put the phone down on someone and in that situation I can understand if you're on the other end of the phone you might think well look, there's this 25 year old guy here who's you know not listening to me and I'm 40 and so th there is a I think it's less probably you're right less about how I thought I was but more about really understanding how other people might perceive your behavior and making sure you're um you're taking that into account well let me reassure you that the modern incarnation of John Sills would have to work really hard to be <laughs> arrogant thank you, you take my meaning so yeah there you go. yeah back to you Richie yeah, look, I, I find that interesting because, I mean, I take the first part of your Nan's advice to heart, to be honest with you. Risky <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if you're talking about laughing at the world. I'm a pretty serious guy. But hey, here we are. Um, John, I want to pick up on something you talked about when you said you were just at the cusp of, of diving into your first major role grad program, HSBC, and actually perhaps, you know, part or, or a major part of, of that decision that they took was the experience that you had direct to customer in those market stalls versus the degree. And it's interesting because I sort of felt exactly the same when I was going for that interview. Um, and in fact, I recall it like like tomorrow um, or yesterday, rather. Um, and I just wonder, what's your take on this? I mean, you know, degree versus experience. I mean, how does that play out? You know, you recruit um, consultants all the time. And how much weight are you putting on either or both? Yeah, it's a really good question. It's something we wrestle with, actually. I mean, we have some brilliantly smart people come and come and join us and wonderfully and this, this is actually true with with the recruits and in other parts of my career as well you know brilliantly smart people but um it, but those that have had direct experience with customers at the start are often just an edge ahead you know it take, it smooths out over time because if you get the right people they're happy to dive in and as, as you know a lot of our work is about going out and meeting customers so people that come and work for us specifically do then very quickly go to contact centers and are listening to calls and are meeting customers so there's a slight balance with us but I, I think just just having that reality uh, you mentioned earlier actually is is so important particularly if you're working in a world where you're you know in more of a head office environment and you're coming up with comms or you're coming up with strategy everything looks good on a powerpoint like you can make anything look really good and look like the best idea in the world but when it hits that reality of customers 
it, customers don't behave how you want them to behave. And it's not a case of, well, customers have got to change to fit us. You've got to understand how people work, whether that's the kind of how they make, how they make decisions or the behaviors that they, that they have, <laughs> because that's how you fix your design. And I'm laughing because like, two weeks ago, I went to the London transport museum and I'll send you the photo afterwards. And when you go into the gents toilets at the London transport museum, they've got this beautifully designed hand basin, it's kind of quite, it's white, quite low, kind of quite curved it's got kind of taps coming out and above it they've had to put a sign saying this is not a urinal the urinal is further down this way <laughs> because it it's lovely as a hand basin but it looks just like a urinal and 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 I just thought it was a great example of someone's design that I thought god isn't this beautiful but they're not connected the 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 human behavior so yeah to answer your question I think it's I think it's really valuable to have that real world experience because for people I don't know for me I still keep in my head some of my HSBC customers that were coming to my branch in Wokenham or in Reading. And, and I think, what would they think of this idea? Really, what would they think? And when you're designing a, you know, a letter, what would that really land like or when you're designing a, a new floor layout? So I think it's really crucial just to give you that real world experience and, and understand how people actually work in the real world. Mm, very profound, very good. I'm going to stay profound. I've alluded to it a couple of times. Um, you work Adoption UK and Young Enterprise. What what draws you to want to give back, John? Yeah, I think I think Young Enterprise, um, so I've worked with Young Enterprise for a long time, uh, at, with credit to HSBC, who are, were and still are one of their big sponsors. So when I started at HSBC, I started out as a, um, uh, as, a, as a kind of mentor there. So th- there's two answers. The first answer is, at first, I really enjoyed it. It was the best part of my job, actually, going out, meeting these young adults. You know, they're six. If you don't know Young Enterprise, they're a charity. They help. Um, they work with young adults to kind of understand what life is like in business. So they, they have the thing called a, a, um, a company program where six formers get to effectively run their own, build and run their own company. It's a bit like a drag, a, an apprentice task. You know, they build and run their own company for a year. And it was just amazing. You go there and they'd be full of creativity and energy and ideas and spirit and desire. And if I'm honest, a lot of the stuff that was missing when you went to the big corporates, you know, when you're in head office, where it felt like there's just constantly barriers and reasons why we can't do anything. The, 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 the kids with Young Enterprise were just like, no, we're going to do anything. We're going to take over the world. So there was a lot of that. The second answer, which is probably more to your point of of, of giving back. Um, well, I'm not quite sure I see it like that, but but is. I, I'm very aware, like I said before, that I had no idea these kind of roles existed, that innovation was even a thing, that customer experience was a thing, that this was a job when I was growing up. There just weren't those role models around me. And I think it's so important for me. It's almost the biggest thing when you start to look at, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, social uh, tensions that we've got or the split between those that get there and those that don't is how do they have the right role models? Do they know the possibility exists to be able to do these to do these roles and I think if you can work with people at 16 and 17 and start to um, instill in them this kind of entrepreneurial spirit this enterprising mindset as Sharon Davis at Young Enterprise calls it it starts to open up a world of opportunity for them that they might not otherwise know is is there um, and particularly if you're working with schools in more disadvantaged areas um, where again they're, they're even less likely to have that network around them so that's that's what I almost quite selfishly get out of it in the first part the second part, I think, is why I think it's so important. Yeah, no, John, it's tremendous. And, and of course, you know, you play a big role with us at the School of Marketing as well and, and helping those young people through in our industry. So, you know, it, it's, uh, it's really appreciated. Yeah, uh, and it's exactly the same, Richard. I think you're doing a brilliant job with it. And every time that you, you come out with new things, it just makes so much sense just to be able to give people, like you say, those mentors or that access to some of the people that you interview on here, for example. You know, it just creates this ability to share knowledge that wasn't there for me when I was younger at least. So John, look, I'm sure um, at, you know, to this point, we've painted a pretty picture and a nice ebb and flow to your career and, and your journey and some of the experiences, but I'm sure it hasn't come without some undulations as well. I say that politely. That's a nice word to use, right? Yeah, I like that. <laughs> but tell us about it. I mean, I mean, what, what do you think are some of the major setbacks that you've had and perhaps some of the key learnings? Uh, yeah, I think, um, it, it's interesting because I actually going forward we were saying earlier about confidence and arrogance I, I don't I never really consider it in that way which is quite an obvious thing to say which many people say but because you do learn from everything like I was saying before I just kind of try stuff and I'm fairly okay if it if it doesn't work so 
have never really kind of had this oh here's the, li- the list of things I do think there's things that I should have done earlier so like starting to write would have been a much better thing to do earlier I also think there's been moments that I'm not sure I'd describe as uh, well I probably would describe as und- undulations actually but they've just been much tougher times so being um you know a bank manager during the financial crisis you know and being in those branches on the days where you know people are queuing up outside or running in and having to think on your feet and I'm, I'm sure I made lots of mistakes at that time about what I was saying to people because you're just trying to think on your feet and just trying to kind of get through things as as much as possible I probably made some um some mistakes with particular customers that I learned a lot from as well about how you have to be careful to not be uh, how to describe it not be kind of overly so or you have to read the room maybe put it that way you have to read the room I remember one customer came in and it was a Saturday and the, it was a really long queue in the branch and this was in in Reading branch and it was a bit of a dump at the time we were waiting to do a refurbishment and she kind of said she wanted to come in to talk about a loan and she started moaning about the queue and I kind of made a kind of offhand jokey comment about well you know, tell Reading Council that because they're the ones that are getting in the way of our planning application. To which, of course, she replied, "I'm a Reading councillor," uh, and then my <laughs> and my face went red. And and amazingly, she ended up getting seen very quickly uh, <laughs> in front of the people and getting the biggest loan that she that she wanted. So I think there's um, that. I also think, without bringing the 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 the, uh, the mood down too much, I think I learned a lot from a couple of really difficult moments so when I was an area manager one of my team passed away really suddenly um like of a heart attack in while we were in kind of team meetings and and that it just brings a whole new perspective and you know and again there were things I did wrong there I remember kind of I was in a branch and I heard the news and I I needed to talk to someone so I called in one of the other people and I told them what happened but then I immediately went to try and help sort it all out but then I left them on their own just kind of stirring with the news but you learn so much from those kind of situations about what really matters and what doesn't and actually when you're an employer what a responsible employer look like because so much of the rest of my you know the next few weeks was all about actually his wife and looking after the family and what we were going to do there and and the that was at the bank and the bank were very supportive then that's when they really stood out as a good employer and then I think during COVID as well you know running a small business during COVID absolutely made lots of mistakes um, again trying to think on on your feet and you know there's there's in a sense you can only ever learn from those like I'm not sure if I did that position again at the same point I'd do anything differently if it happened now I'd do something differently because I've learned but if you rewound time and just put me back at the start of any of those yeah. that you know those mistakes are still going to be made because that is that is kind of how you learn so they're, they're probably the things that I reflect on more where um you know it was just those situations in fact there's a guy called Morgan Housel who's a brilliant writer he's written a book called The Psychology of Money Um, and he says the world breaks every seven to eight years in some way there's a a, a recession or a war or a pandemic so don't think that well when we get through this it will be plain sailing because it never is there's always something and so the best he says the best skill you can learn is resilience and how you're going to deal with things when they go wrong because it's always going to happen now obviously for us we've had all three of those war and pandemic and recession in the space of two years but still you know don't presume it's all going to be okay i thought it was more i thought i thought more the advice today should be more like it's going to be broken for seven years as opposed to broken every (laughs) seven years yeah yeah permanently broken (laughs) exactly yeah so john i think penultimate question um i just had to get it in because your blog this week i thought was really profound in terms of everyone knows that the new way of working, hybrid working, is challenging from a separation point of view. But you brought in a new point to that, which was this thing about ghosts. Mm-hmm. Not not like literal ghosts, we won't go there. But just, I think everyone would benefit from understanding this because there's consequences of this new way of working. So could, could you bring that to life a little? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's from, from a, a podcast, a Hurry Slowly podcast with a guy called Sean Blander, which I listened to during COVID. And and he, I thought, brilliantly talked about how when you're at work or actually at any point in your life, you have these experiences and these experiences kind of leave their leave their mark. So he, he gave a very clear example of if you're having an argument with someone at work and you, you have that in a room in the office, then actually the next time you go in that office, you kind of feel it because the environment is the same. You get triggered 
by you know a bit like you know if you go back to a seafront you went to when you were a kid and the sea and the smell kind of takes you back to that feeling and you get that when you go into this 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 room at work um but the problem with us doing that at home is all of those ghosts if you want to call he calls them ghosts of these moments are now around your house so all of a sudden you're having that argument with someone or having it could be just a difficult conversation or just having a bad day that's now happening you know in your living room or on your kitchen table and so when you finish work for the day you don't now get that ability to w physically walk away from where that happened you know get in the car get on the train get back home to a fresh environment because where you're eating your dinner is where that moment happened so you're still triggered by it and, and it's harder to walk away with it and he, he gives a great example about um his back garden then became his kind of escape space where he'd have all these tough meetings at work so we'd go out into his back garden to be able to kind of calm down but that has also created a bit of a problem with his back garden because that now that's you know uh, connected to you know needing to de-stress so i just thought it was a really really interesting thought and one that i really could see and really bought into and one that i think is is yeah not quite not quite been expressed when we look at the the home office debate how wonderful what what a wonderful um sort of a uh, way to describe you know what is a commonplace today and uh and perhaps as a as a final question then i, I really I just want to dig deeper into this is i mean do you have any advice i mean what is the next phases because clearly the whole world has gone hybrid of, of sorts and nature so there's going to be that there's going to be people in that in that position so what would you say to help what's the the anecdote yeah i mean so when i was uh when i was at the bank i, I went on a leadership course and they they gave you it was the best learning course i've ever been on it was the kind of one you don't get now like five days in person you know off-site uh you know really with a bar in the evening same bar actually as i as a graduate <laughs> graduate scheme was at. um and they said the first the first three rules of any kind of people management is know your people, know your people, know your people, which still to this day, I think is the truest thing I've probably ever heard. And I think that becomes so clear when you start to look at the work from home, work remotely debate. Because I, Actually, I don't think it's a debate. I think the answer is, you know, we should be working flexibly. But what that answer looks like for different companies and different people and different jobs is very different. So you can't just have a draconian, you have to be in five days or you have to be in four days or we're all working from home. You know, I just don't think it can work in that way. Now, what you might want to do is build a team that's perfectly, you know, that's fully virtual. That's fine. And then you're deliberately looking for people that work really well in that way. Um, or you might want to build a team that, you know, is happy to be, be in the office. But I think you just have to be, you have to, have flexible working as a way of working you have to be flexible in your approach to flexible working and then you have to just be talking to the team that's what we did at, at the foundation i talk about our, our approach which was this thing called wednesday plus one where when when we came out of covid we had this odd situation where the team kind of wanted to be back in seeing each other because they like hanging out with each other and actually for us some of our work was okay online but actually we we really needed to be together for that creativity and collaboration but they were starting to kind of come in the office, but because there was no real structure around it, they would like come in and they'd be the only person in on that day. And then that was like even more rubbish than not coming in at all. So we said, well, let's put just a tiny bit of structure around it. So everyone comes in on a Wednesday and then try and come in either the Tuesday or the Thursday, but we'll all work from home Monday to Friday. And instantly it transformed things because everyone got really excited about coming in on the Wednesday then. And we said, well, we'll buy a team lunch. And we still do that now. Every Wednesday we'll pay for lunch. We'll get a team lunch and we'll all sit around and have lunch together. You know, and then maybe we'll go out in the evening as well. So people started to get really excited, really started to enjoy being with each other, started to come in Tuesday and Thursdays. Actually, those days started to fill up a bit more. Most people still work from home Monday and Friday. And now we shape what we do around those days. So any workshops or collaborative sessions we do are in those three days in the middle. Monday's a bit more functional. Friday's a bit more kind of catch up on catch up on the week. But the only way you've been able to do that is being really open and talking to the team and saying, well, what do you want? What could work? And working out and what I said earlier, trying stuff, see what worked, getting stuff wrong, working out what the right balance is. And, and I think that's kind of the answer. You've got to be flexible about flexible working um, and not just pick one or the other. Because if you do, then you're going to lose good people either way. Uh, and so you need to kind of work out what's what's going to work best. And I would say this also for your customers. I do think a big problem we've got with contact centers at the moment is is driven by this and this lack of coaching and leadership so yeah flexible about flexible working is probably my 
my uh, answer to that. Well, well, what a lovely way to 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 close, John. It's been absolutely fabulous. I love, I just love that saying, be flexible in your approach to flexible working. How wonderful. But look, um, it, it's my job now to try and summarize some of the amazing insights that, that we've heard over the last little while. But before I do that, I think it's important just to, to, tell, to say to everybody that, of course, John's just come out with The Human Experience, his new book. Of course, we've talked about it. Um, but it's it's wonderful, and if you you know if, if you've been interested or or, or um, excited about what you've heard this morning, then clearly there's lots lots more insights in the book. So go pick it up, and it's in Waterstones as well in Piccadilly. If you guys are in London, of course, all the usual bookstores. I feel like an advert now, um, in Amazon and the like. There we go. So here we go. Some of the key thoughts um, that came from the session. So I think the first thing we kicked off was around the principle of flow and getting into your flow. And I suspect that's far more reaching than just writing, although that's the that's how you use it. Um, right to learn, um, observation. We could just picture you as that one person in the um, in the, the train station there looking up whilst all of us are on our phones. Um, thank you to Patrick, because I think he was the trigger moment with that post-it in the room. Um, you are ready to write a book. But I think the key message from John beyond that was actually you don't need anybody to tell you what you need to do. Just go out and actually make it happen. And do so with what John terms as being a habit and a commitment. I think that's really important to commit to it and actually then hold yourself against it. We can still see that uh, diary with the cobwebs that, that John writes in that she hasn't picked up in six months. So have a commitment um, and hold yourself to it. Um, of course, John started his career very much um, at the cold face of learning about customers. And actually, I think that's been a common thread both throughout your career as well as this talk. Um, know your customers, know your people, um, you know, know the know sort of or get a, a much more in-depth insight um, or into your environment in which you, you operate. Uh, never say never as well. I think that's a, a key theme. Clearly, John basically didn't know what he wanted to get into uh, as his next role. And in fact, maybe he was a bit adverse to it. But wonderful conversations later, he is where he is today. Um, I love how, you know, you talk about arrogance, but actually your humility shines through more than anything. You use the terminology and, and the word luck quite a few times as well within that. Um, I don't think it's quite around luck, but you talked about planned serendipity or creating serendipitous moments. Um, and I think that's a wonderful turn of phrase to be using in this context, um, especially for you, John, over and above luck. Um, you're a guy who makes stuff happen. I'm not sure if you do drink a whiskey in the night, but you certainly have a laugh. So thank you, Nan, for that lovely two pieces of advice there. Um, experience, um, you know, is, is, is perhaps a little bit more valuable um, at stages than, than degrees and, and the, theoretic, shall we say. Both important. Um, but certainly, you know, getting real lived experience is, is really important. Um, tougher moments around crises and how you manage them um, and some real hairy moments that you've had to face and uh, talking and thinking on your feet um, being really, really important as a skill that you've learned along the way. Um, and finally, I think the, the, the key point to note on or to end on is uh, I'm not going to sleep too well anymore because I do a lot of working from home and clearly the ghosts in my house still exist, but actually being able to create that safe space um, for you to get away from some of those ghosts and, and when you when you need to um, is is crucially important. So John, I hope that's given you a fair sum of, of what we've talked about. It's been truly, truly wonderful. And I really do hope the best for your book as well as your ongoing career. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, 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 Richie. Thanks. Can I just say one more thing? Is that okay to end yeah. without yeah. ruining without ruining a perfect ending? Which were well, two things actually. One to slightly correct you. I never said you had to drink the whiskey at night. Uh, that can be at any point during the day. But but, but the other thing, I, I just wanted to, again, take the opportunity to thank both of you because you've both been hugely important in my career, Richie, in terms of being a brilliant role model for doing your own thing and going off and going out and leaving the corporates and creating something brilliant all the way up to then introducing me to the publisher for the book, which I'm forever grateful for. And Mark being the manager that came in and showed me that you could be a really true human, authentic, customer-led leader, even in a big corporate but also with your support of that kind of to be interesting, be interested. I'm not sure if you remember, I used to watch TED Talks and send them out. And you were the one that encouraged me to send these TED Talks out to everyone in the company and email them around and give me really, you know, you gave me such great support and belief in actually gathering together these things that I was interested in and sharing them widely. So you've both been yeah, hugely influential in my career. So I wanted to say thank you for that as well, just to complete the loving for the day.
Lovely. Thank you, John.